connecting to the cloud server. All right. All right, here we Good. go. I'm going to get us started. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn my video off because um, I just, I don't want it on. Um, so I'm Jenny. I think you all know me. Um, I'm Information Literacy Coordinator. I proposed this series because I really wanted us to have um, some opportunities to continue learning and sharing and uh, working together and building community during this current pandemic. Now that we are pretty much all working remotely, I hope this is going to help us continue to do that learning and sharing, even though we are working at a distance. Um, we will have an archived recording of this training later. It will be available through the ULVLC LibGuide which I am sure many of you have visited before, but I will go ahead and put it in there. Um, we do have something every day this week, which is very exciting. And then um, we should have, uh, we have some things that are being scheduled in the weeks to come. Um, if you are interested in leading a session of any kind or leading a discussion in Canvas or really anything, please let me know because I would love to, um, kind of keep keep this going because I have a feeling we're going to be working from home for a while. Um, all right, so with that in mind, I'm going to just give you some basic logistics. Um, I think we're all getting pretty great at Zoom these days, but um, if you um, aren't as comfortable with Zoom, I am going to make sure uh, everybody was muted on entry, but if you have a microphone, um, there will be opportunities for you to use it and you can um, unmute yourself when you need to. Um, but you're always welcome to participate in the chat. So Brown's going to be going through some, um, you know, step-by-step -step tech training stuff here. I understand that people may have questions as he is talking, and he and I have discussed this in advance. So if you have a question that is sort of specific to something that he's doing on screen right then, please put it in the chat, and I will interrupt and ask him that question if he hasn't been able to see it. Um, I think that's going to be the most effective way to get questions answered in sort of real time. Um, Brown also went through this, um, but we have some fun feedback options um, in our uh, participants panel. Um, and so Brown introduced me to this. Actually, I hadn't seen this, um, but the, the yes, no, go slower, go faster might be things that you want to use during this session, either to respond to Brown's questions or to let him know um, that he, you need him to slow down or you wish he would go faster. I have a feeling it'll be more of the wait, wait, slow down kind of thing because most yeah. people aren't like, yeah, pivot tables, push it ahead. All right. So if you have any technical issues, please feel free to use the chat and I will try to guide you through some possible solutions. But if worse comes to worse and you're not able to hear or see the session, um, we will have a recording available and it will be up on that LibGuide that I already sent you the link to. So before I introduce the Brown officially, does anybody have any questions in the chat? Okay, looking good. Just remember if you do, please put them in there and I will address them or ask Brown to. So this session here on April 1st, new month, is being hosted by Brown Biggers, systems programmer in ARIT. And he is going to help us all get started with pivot tables. And Brown, if at any point you want me to share that link with the data sets, you just tell me and I'll put it in the chat. All right, thank you very much, Jenny. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm gonna do my best to try and address the camera as much as I can, but the way my setup is, my camera's over here and the monitor I'm gonna be working on is this way. So I'm gonna do my best to maintain, you know, good uh, uh, webinar kind of etiquette. So uh, what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna talk about pivot tables. I'm sure that many of you have either heard about them or seen them. Um, they're a very fascinating uh, tool to use. I think they are also kind of intimidating because sometimes people will see them and they'll look, oh wow, these are great. And then they go and try and just apply it on any old uh, uh, tabular data set and it doesn't work and they get frustrated and it's kind of hard to deal with. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna transition over to a fairly short uh, slides presentation and then we'll have an opportunity to work together on some stuff. All right, I'm gonna present here, share screen. Let's see which screen, let's make sure I get the right one. There we go. Is everybody seeing a board? that says getting started with pivot tables, I hope. 
Okay, so getting started with pivot tables. So first off, what is a pivot table? Oh, you don't see it? Don't see it? Oh, hold on a second. Yeah, I'm not seeing it yet either. There we go. How about now? This is looking promising. Yep. Okay, let me go back a yep. little bit. Thank you. I have not fully learned my Zoom etiquette, so my apologies. All right, so here we are. Thank you. Uh, getting started with pivot tables. This is uh, today's session. And what we want to talk about is Zoomikit. Uh, yes, Zoomikit is a nice word for it. I love some portmanteaus. Uh, what is a pivot table? It is a data summarization tool. It's a way of taking a data set and trying to um, learn some insights from it kind of in a zoomed out sense. Um, we take data that are in rows and we group them by one or more characteristics. And then we use operations to determine um, uh, we, to make decisions about th those groups. And I'll we'll talk about specifics about that in just a second. I think the easiest way to talk about uh, pivot tables is to kind of look at them visually. So if we have this diagram, we have a bunch of shapes, we have a bunch of colors, we have a bunch of numbers. Imagine that these shapes represent data points that you're looking at. And what you want to do is to provide some sort of summary of what is going on. And you want to present that to people who are maybe not very familiar with the data. Well, the first thing that we want to do is we want to group the data into meaningful groups. So maybe we could group by color. So here we have all the orange ones together, the blue ones together, the yellow ones, red, green, so on and so forth. We could group by shape. Maybe that's something that's a little bit more relevant to what we're talking about. We could even group by the value that they have. We wanna look at the ones that are all five and greater, for example. But the idea is we want to group them. And so we want to group them into what are basically teams. And we're picking a way to group them into teams via, by some characteristic. And then we choose a way to divide them that way. Once we've divided the information, these data points into teams, we pick out a value that we can use to represent those teams. So. If we go back to the example with the colored shapes and we say we're going to break them up, oh, I skipped one thing. One of the, um, the single value to represent it perhaps could be like the average or the maximum value or the number, like the count of the values in it. Let's look at the colored um, shapes again. So if we take them and we group them by color here, we have the orange ones and the yellow ones and so forth we can say we're going to pick a value to represent them. And in this example, we're taking the sum of the values that are on each of the colored shapes. So for example, let's look at the blue ones. We have four blue shapes. Five plus two is seven, plus three is 10, plus three is 13. And so that, rep that single value represents the blue shapes. And if we say, let's go to the red ones, for example, one plus two is three, plus nine is 12, plus six is 18. And you'll see over here that the red values are represented by the sum 18. Now it doesn't have to be the sum. We could say the average value for each of the colored shapes is as follows. So, you know, the average, the mean, um, is to take the sum of them and divide by the total number of them. So five, the blue ones again, five plus two is seven plus three, is 10 plus three is 13 divided by four is 3.25. Now you're gonna have lots of opportunities to pick different values here, but more often than not, you're gonna be dealing with sum, average and count. So how do we use this? We're going to, we need to make sure that the data sets that we're trying to do this with are formatted in a way that works well with Zoom, uh, excuse me, Zoom, we're in Zoom, with pivot tables. The first thing to consider is that data is in a list. A lot of times when we're provided a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet or something like that, the data is already kind of made into rows and columns and things like that. But it's best to think of it as a list where each row represents a different data point. So if we're looking at the, if we're looking at our spreadsheet and we have our spreadsheet like this, we want to make sure that every successive row represents a separate data point. Also, every single column for each of these rows has similar information. We want to compare the information in the columns. Now, another consideration with 
pivot tables is we want to think about when it might work poorly. So if data is already pivoted, and we'll see what that means in a little bit, but sometimes you're given a spreadsheet where the data is already done such that the rows and the columns and the intersections of those two represent some sort of value or sum. And it's hard to get that data back out into a form that a pivot table will work well with. If the data in the column varies wildly, so, excuse me, wide, widely, not wildly, not like dancing or craziness or whatever, but imagine if you have for each of your data rows, one of your columns is a specific URL to a data point. That URL is probably going to be completely different all the way down. And so that particular column probably won't do you a lot of good in a pivot table. And if there are inconsistent spellings, um, uh, pivot tables are built upon the idea that there is consistent data in the columns. And that can be anything, but if you start having things where it is just slightly different, if people say, for example, you're looking at something and it should say, um, uh, I'm trying to think of like uh, uh, government and society, but another person has put society and government, then those two will be grouped differently in the uh, pivot table. So let's get started. So Jenny, if I could ask a favor, would you please share the link that folks can get to to download? There should be two Excel files for us to download. Yes, I will share right now. Also, Darren Lee, thank you for letting me know that you could hear me typing. Oops. All right, so I shared this link. Um, I believe that it, I'm pretty sure we have it set up so that you would be able to download the XLS, XLSX files, those Excel files. Um, so if people um, have, okay, great, works, yes, and can download, thanks. Need permission to enter. So Susan, are you logged into UNCG or are you potentially logged into more than one Gmail account because it should be set up for anyone at UNCG. I'm going to just double check that. Anyone at UNCG with the link. If browser. Yep, perfect, Susan. So Rachel asks a very good question. Can this be done through Google Sheets? The answer is yes. Google Sheets does have a Google, uh, excuse me, a pivot tables function. I'm choosing to use Excel right now for the sake of consistency because there are some idiosyncrasies that are just slightly different. If you want to open it up in Google Sheets and work through it that way, I think it will work. I have not tested it in Google Sheets to be sure. Um, after we're done here, perhaps uh, I can work with you on making sure that you're getting the functionality that you're expecting. Okay, Rachel will be the Google Sheets testee or tester. Let's make sure we don't have more than one testee. Okay, so uh, I think that folks here probably have the shapes document. Can everyone see the shapes document in the shared screen now currently? Okay, wonderful. So this data here, this spreadsheet represents the, sh the shapes we were looking at in the presentation. We have triangle, pentagon, circle, so on and so forth. Yeah, Charlie, there's two files. There's books, classes, and there's shapes. We'll need uh, shapes now. We'll work with books, classes in a moment. Um, this is the exact data that I was just using with an illustration. And what we're going to do is we're going to pivot this. So the way that that works is we're just going to select these columns right here by dragging across the top. And I'm going to be using some shortcuts in Excel, and I'll bring those up as I use them to try and make it so that uh, we can move a little faster. But again, if you have any questions, um, Jenny and I will try and get them as soon as we can. So I've selected these three columns. And what I want to do is I want to insert. Now, if you have the full window here, you'll probably see insert pivot table, but it may be under this tables thing here. And that might be outside of the window, my apologies, but there's something that's here, it's insert pivot table. And when you select that, you should get this screen here. Select the data that you want to analyze, 
and it'll tell you a range and where you want to put it. This range says sheet one, A through C, and we're gonna put it in a new worksheet. So let's go ahead and hit okay. And your pivot table should look something like this. We have our fields over on the right, and we have a pivot table, and it says to build a report, choose fields from the pivot table field list. So as long as I've selected inside this box here, I'm going to see the pivot table fields. If I click outside of it, they go away. So let's go back inside here. And the first thing I wanna do is just pick one of my fields and I can either click here to check the box or I can drag it and drop it into areas. I'm gonna drag and drop shape down to rows. And you'll see immediately that we have the four different shape names here. And what we've done is we have grouped by that column of shape. If I then drag, say for example, value down to values, it's gonna to default to sum of value here, and it automatically sums the values based upon their symbols. And if we go back to the uh, presentation that I was sharing before, sure enough, we can look at circles, and we can see uh, shapes and things like that. And if we start looking at the values here, we can start manually adding them up. So let's actually go back to sheet one and look. We have this table here and we can sort it just like normal. I'm gonna go over here and sort by shape. And then I can drag here and I can sum, and it will tell me down here at the bottom that the sum is 21. And sure enough, next to circles, the sum is 21. Now we can do things like, for example, I can go over here and click on this little I, and I can change it to count. This will tell me how many occurrences there are of circle, how many occurrences of pentagon, how many occurrences of square and triangle. Now this is neat. And it does some things that I think we were interested in, but this is where the real power of pivot tables comes in. Because we've just started doing rows. We can now pivot into intersections. I'm going to drag color over to columns. And what this has now done is it's created column labels of the colors and rows of the shapes. And just looking here, the intersections of those two tell me the individual counts of each of these objects. So I have one blue circle, for example, but I do have two orange pentagons. I also have three green squares. This keeps track of the sum of green shapes here, and this keeps track of the sum of pentagons. And then I have the total sum here. Now, if we change count of value back to sum of value, again, the sum of the values on the orange pentagon is 10. If I go back over here to this and I sort first by shape, then by color, orange, let's see what we were doing. We were looking at orange pentagons. Three plus seven is in fact 10, and that's what we see here. We can even go so far as to say the average value on these. The average value of a blue object is 3.25. The average value of a square is 5. The average of all of them is 4.375. Okay, this one is, let's be honest, it's a little contrived and it's shapes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with a data set that's not true but it's a little bit closer to maybe something we'd work with. And this was inspired by a discussion that Sam and I were having a, the other day. And this was gonna be something I was gonna be working, she and I were gonna be working on. So what I've done is there's a separate sheet called Books Classes. If you'll download that, please, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share over to that. But because it's such a large data set, I'm going to share my entire screen. It may make things small. So if things are too small for you, let me know and I'll share just the screen itself. This, as we're transitioning, might be a good time if people have any questions about what Brown just showed on the shapes document. Um, I haven't seen any questions come up. Um, oh, Rachel said it works great in sheets. That's awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. 
So if there are no questions, I'm going to move on to the books classes file. And I'm going to share my entire screen this time. That way we have as much of the data as possible in case there were things that maybe, because I did notice there were a couple of times when there were things that were maybe outside of the screen that were not seen. Can everybody see, let's see, I wanna make sure that I've got the right screen. Is everybody seeing the books classes sheet with the pivot tables in the background? Yes, cool. I'm seeing it. Right. it looks like most people are. Excellent, okay. So what I've done here is I've created an entirely fictitious data set. Um, and what's interesting, uh, I'll just go ahead and type this link in here. Um, if you go to Makaru, like kangaroo, I think it's makaru.net. It might be, let me, I'm going to click on that and make sure it's not disgusting. Nope, it's not real. Try Makaru. Yes, makaru.com. I would try makaru.com. It allows you to generate fictitious data sets that work very well with pivot tables. And what I did was I created one that looked like uh, books. So in this case right here, I have a date stamp. I have a course and they're all, um, there's uh, I think five different departments and they're all classes 101, 102, 201, 202, 202 uh, 301, 302, and so on and so forth, 303. I have a class size and I have a book cost. So we're gonna do the same thing that we did before with the shapes. And this time though, we're gonna do it with a much larger data set. This has, I believe, a thousand rows. So we're just gonna go ahead and grab all of this. And just like before, we're gonna do a pivot table. So we're gonna to go to insert, oops, pivot table. It, we grabbed by highlighting a section, we're gonna get it from the books classes tab and we're gonna get A through D, and we're gonna insert it as a new worksheet. Here we are, it's, this is very similar to what we saw before. I'll shrink this down a little bit. And we have our fields over here. We have our pivot table. Again, we're inside the pivot table. If we click out, the fields disappear. We have a date stamp, we have course, we have class size and book cost. Now, one of the things that is very interesting about pivot tables is it's really, smart about information that are dates. So if I take this date stamp, if I just click check next to it, it'll put it into values. And that doesn't necessarily give us what we want right now. But if I drag date stamp to rows, it automatically assumes that I might want to start looking at years or quarters. So over here, our row labels have been created, just like we saw before with the shapes and the colors. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my course in the columns. I have the row labels as being the dates, quarters, years, and the column labels being each of the classes. So let's do a count of book cost. I'm gonna do count first. This is telling me how many books were purchased for each year in each uh, class. So in, for example, in Bio 303 in 2018, 40 different books were purchased. In Bio 102 in 2018, two were purchased. And we can click on these little pluses and see a little bit more what's going on. In Bio 303, for example, nine were purchased in quarter three, 31 were purchased in, in quarter four. We can drill down even further and see how many were purchased per month. So just to verify, let's look at what's happening here. We've got Bio 102. There were two books purchased in 2018. I can go back over here. I can sort just like I was doing before. I'm gonna sort by class, course, excuse me. And then I should have sorted, sort by course, and then I'm gonna sort by date stamp. And we were looking here at Bio 102. There were two classes, two books purchased in 2018. Let's see if that's true. So it was Bio 102, and sure enough, two books were purchased in 2018. Now the crazier one, let's look at say like, uh, let's look at uh, Bio 301, for example. 15 were purchased in 2018. So if we scroll down and Bio 301, 
starting here. So it's 5301 2018. Did I get that right? So they were purchased in 2018. Yes, there are, sorry. There are 15 that were purchased in 2018. So our pivot table is doing a lot of analysis on the backside. And we're able to see a bunch of different things where um, we're seeing some interesting analyses. I'm gonna go back over here to count of book cost and I'm gonna change this to sum and hit okay. This is now adding up the cost of all of these books. If we go back over, we're looking at Bio 301 in 2018 and we drag down here, the amount sum is $1,744.75. And sure enough, that's what we see here. Now, what's uh, these here are just numbers with decimals. We can format them. For example, if we go back over here to this, this info button and click number, just like in Excel, we can represent this as currency and then hit OK. And now we see dollar amounts. Okay. Now this is interesting, certainly. We can manipulate a bunch of different things, but what we may want to do is we may want to transform the data before we get into the, uh, the, excuse me, the pivot table. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go back over to my books classes thing here, and I'm gonna scroll up to the top. You see all of the courses have a three letter department code followed by a three digit um, level. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a field in the middle here by right clicking and insert. And I'm going to create a department field. And in this first cell here, I'm going to type, e excuse me, type equals L-E-F-T for left, open parentheses, and I'm going to click on the course. I'm going to hit comma and I'm going to get three characters. And what this is going to do is it's going to grab the first three characters from the left side of the previous cell. And then I'm gonna hit a closed parentheses. See, that's given us bio. And what this will do, because I know the data, it will go through and anytime it sees one of these codes, it's just gonna grab the first three letters. And the first three letters is the department. Here's the shortcut. See this little box right here in the uh, lower right corner? If I double click that, what will happen is it will look to the uh, column immediately to the left. And as long as those cells are full, it will automatically fill all of the cells all the way down with what is in that cell. Since there are no spaces, it automatically filled all the way down and we can see that it's starting to grab the other departments like CST, ENG, HIS, and so on and so forth. Now, if we go back to our pivot table, we don't see department here. And that's because we haven't updated the pivot table. We haven't told the pivot table, hey, by the way, that data you were looking at has changed. So while I'm in the pivot table, I'm gonna click pivot table analyze, and we'll see change data source here. When I click on this, remember this said books classes A colon D before. I've inserted a value in the middle and it thought, hey, they're probably gonna to wanna to include this, so let's go ahead and include it automatically. And so now it's going from A to E. I'm gonna hit OK just to verify. And then I'm gonna hit refresh. As we see here, there's now a department code. What we can do with this is we can add that to our columns where we're already looking at course. And if we drag course below department, we now are grouping by department for first, and then within department, we're grouping by course. If you click on these little minuses here, we can look at departmental totals for each of these things. And so we can see that bio in 2018, they spent $9,343.89. Now I won't go over to the other uh, uh, I won't go back over to the other thing because that will take forever for us to count, but I hope we can trust at this point that pivot tables are calculating what we need to see. We can drill down here into months. We can see that bio in, did 564. And just to verify, we can drag across these and it says, sure, 564.48 is the same value we see here, the bio total. 
we can see that the total amount spent in 2019 is 47,103.55. And if we drag across these, we see down here that the sum adds up to this. Pretty neat. Let's go back and let's look at one of the pitfalls that happens if you have data that has, say, for example, um, incorrect spellings. If I go back over here to books classes, and I'm just going to grab this bio 201. And let's say whoever was doing the data input on these things misspelled bio. They just accidentally, instead of hitting the O, they hit an I here twice. When I go back over to this and I refresh my data, all of a sudden I have a new column that is largely irrelevant. We have a BII201. Now, what has happened here is that one particular data point has essentially been corrupted. This 14591 is no longer to tallied in with the bio data. So if you see things extraneous like this, it may be that you have a typo somewhere. This is probably a good time to talk about why it would be a bad idea to say pivot on URLs when you have a list of a thousand resources and they all have different URLs. Each one of those columns or rows, depending upon which side you put it in, would be a different URL. So this is why it's important if you're using pivot excuse me, data in a pivot table that you have consistent spellings and things. So I'm going to go back over here to this. I'm going to change this back to by O and then refresh my data. And it takes it out. Okay. So what we've done here so far is we've taken a list of books. We've taken a list of dates that books were purchased. We've taken the uh, classes, we've turned them into departments. But if you'll remember, we have class size in here too. We're not using class size yet. Now we could do, say for example, instead of sum of book cost, we could do sum of class size. These are how many people are in each of these classes, right? Now, again, we're 986 purchases made in uh, 2018 for bio, probably not. But this data can be used for another transform. Let's take a look at this. We go back over to books classes. If we look at the top here, Bio 101 bought 36 books at a cost, a unit cost of 8111. But we're not doing any math with those two yet. So we can do the same thing. This time I'm going to create a course cost column. I'm going to go down to this first cell, hit equals 36, which is in D2 times $81.11. And that's what the total cost at that date was. And if we remember our shortcut from before, since the book cost column I know has no gaps in it, I can just click on this cell and double click on this little box and it'll automatically fill that formula all the way down. If we go back over to sheet one and we want to pivot table analyze change data source. Before, when we stuck a value in the middle, it kind of guessed we probably want to keep these things together. But in this case, because course cost was kind of outside of the original rectangle and we didn't add it in the middle, we're going to have to add it into what we have here. Books classes A to E, we actually want to go to F as well. Whenever you see a for, uh, field like this in Excel, you can do one of two things. You can manually type the letter F right here. Or if you see this little box, you can click on it and it allows you to draw your segment again, minimize it, and it gives us the same thing as typing the F. But if we wanted to just draw again like we've been doing in the past, this works. I'm going to hit OK. We go back to our pivot table. We refresh. And we should have a course cost field here. If I get rid of sum of class size and drag course cost down here, this is the sum. Let's go ahead and convert this to currency again. This is the sum by date of the class cost, which is the ca class count times the book cost. 
111,880.53 in bio quarter three, 2018. So we got bio, what was that? Bio 101, whoops. Bio, let's say bio 101, tw uh, 2018 is, $7,429.92, $7,429.92. So the pivot table is again, doing all of this work for us. Now, is this the coolest thing that pivot tables can do? Not by a long shot. Let's say we want to filter this data. We can do a couple of different ways. We can click on these little drop down menus and filter. No, nah, that's not the cool way to do it. See, they're over here as well. I'm gonna, while I'm in my pivot table, I'm gonna go over to, let's see, pivot table analyze and insert slicer. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna insert a slicer for department and hit okay. It drops in this little button feature here. And if I click on these, it will filter it down to the departments that I click on. I can click on ENG for English clicking the plus here to expand or hide as need be. I can hit different departments this way, right? And I can use multiple concurrent slicers together. So if I'm inside this one and I go back to pivot table analyze, I'm gonna insert another slicer, but this time I'm gonna insert a timeline. Since date stamp is recognized as a timeline, I can hit okay and this is a date stamp timeline slicer where we can break down by different months selected here. We can do quarters. So if I wanted to say, look at everything that was in CST quarter one through quarter three of 2019, I have these two sliders that are working concurrently. If I click this here, multi-select, I can look at two simultaneously. I can drag all the way out here and it's going to continue to keep track of our little date stamp thing here. All right, we've got these fabulous things. Is this the coolest thing that pivot tables can do? Again, nope. So I'm going to make sure that I'm inside of my pivot table again. Nope, that's right, Rachel's got my back. And I'm going to insert, let's see, maybe pivot table analyze. Let me make sure I got the right place. Pivot chart. This chart is a dynamically updating chart based upon which filters I have and which calculations I'm doing. If you can see down here, it's already keeping track of both of these things. I've got multi-select. I'm gonna add English in there. I'm gonna bring it out through quarter four, 2020 and it breaks it out just like this. If I want to, I can change the different things in this uh, chart. So let's see if I can remember where this is. Uh, field writing and sets, um, design, design format. Let me make sure I got this right. Ah, change chart type. Let's do a line chart. I can dynamically change the chart type as well. I'm looking at these charts here. I'm gonna remove the filter. These are all of my departments grouped by um, various things. When I minimize here, see, when I minimize and maximize, it automatically does breakouts for whichever column labels I'm looking at. I can remove this date stamp field here. This is my data as transformed, looking through all of this. I can change from sum of course cost. I wanna go back to cl class size, sum of class size here. And we can see these are the sums of class sizes. I wanna look at quarter four, 2018 to 2019 through quarter two. These are my departments. I only wanna look at history. Excuse me, I wanna take history out by as I multi select, but I only wanna look at history. And so each one of these things is being updated in real time based upon the filters and the additions or sums and things like that we're doing. Let's say this 
chart isn't ordered the way that you want it to be. Maybe, for example, it makes sense up in your pivot table for your rows to be one set of values and your columns to be a different set of values. If, for example, that were to happen, you can, but it doesn't show the way you want it to in the columns below, you can switch row and column and it will flip them around for you. This is, would be a perfect example of why you wouldn't want to do that. And it switches back. So pivot tables, when you have the properly formatted data, you're going to be able to do things uh, like make quick analyses, summations. Let's go back over here and take a look at some other things that we have available to us. We have like, I don't know, the average number of people in a class in history. And let's go ahead and go, oops, minimize that. You can, you can also hit the delete key to remove slicers. So this is the average number of history students by quarter and so forth and date stamps. We can minimize down so we just see years. If we want to get really down and dirty and we can see all of this stuff in months. Now again, this isn't real data, mind you. This is, you know, silly data that I made up, but I hope that you can see that this kind of thing can be useful. Just make sure that when you're pivoting on data, that you're using a data set that is formatted such. Because I know what happens is anytime somebody sees one of these pivot tables, they immediately go and they pick a data set that they've already got and they try and do all of these wonderful things and it doesn't work exactly as planned. So anyway, we're at the 11.45 mark. I wanted to make sure that we did have some time for questions at the end. If anybody had any specifics, things that they wanted to see, I'd be happy to show them. Um, but I did want to make sure that we reserve time at the end for that. Yes, so if you have questions, please feel free to chat those in. Um, if it would be easier, uh, you can definitely put your microphone on if you have one and ask your question that way. Um, Brown, we did have a comment from Evan, Evan earlier that was not a question, but so presumably we could do this with our collection overview. This is cool. So would you think it would work for something like a collection overview where you have maybe different types of like resources and then you have the numbers for them? Absolutely. And in fact, one of the nice things about this is we did, admittedly, I picked something that has numeric data over here. And for that, it's going to work the best. Like if you have counts of things like that. But let's say you just had these three columns. You could still do the number of times that Bio 101 appeared in here, the number of times that Bio 102 appeared in 2020. It doesn't have to have necessarily numeric data, but it would be hard to get the average of the word Bio, for example. So yes, I'm sure if the data is formatted similar to this, similarly to this, Evan, it would probably work very well. I definitely want people to be able to ask questions if they have them, but I'm also curious um, and if people are willing to put this in the chat of how they think, like what data they have that they think they might use pivot tables for. I'm thinking I could use it for instruction data for sure. So if people have ideas about how they might use this, we would love to hear that as well. So I'm seeing Maggie says class stats as well. Susan says this looks like my old reports in access govdoc shelf list, but way easier and more functional. Rachel says CST 105 stuff. Learn more about CST 105 tomorrow by attending the first year instruction generations presentation. That was me. Rachel didn't say that, but she'll be there. What, one of the things that I do like about, and it's kind of ironic, I guess, in a sense, but pivot tables punish you for doing too much work. And the, what I mean by that is I'm just going to create a new Excel spreadsheet and I want to bring it over here. I hope everybody can see this blank Excel spreadsheet. We probably all made Excel spreadsheets that looked like this, where I said August, September, October, and then over here I had miscellaneous, in August, I did three. In September, I did five. October, I did two. Um, and let's say I have like patron contacts. 
then I, in August I had 15, so on and so forth. Um, and so what's nice here is that I'm already kind of jumping ahead of myself. I'm doing the pivoting for pivot table. It would be better if I instead, and I'm going to do them over here, said like uh, name, month, count. And then I said like, in uh, I did a miscellaneous in August and I did three of them. And so this way, if I just start putting the data in here, in fact, I could say miscellaneous in August, I did one here, but then I had miscellaneous August, I did two. The pivot table is going to give me this. So the more I just treat it as each one of these rows represents a separate data point, I can do the calculations in pivot tables. Um, I see uh, Deborah saying, uh, does it matter if your data is vertical versus horizontal? I know Tableau has a preference for vertical, right? I don't know much about Tableau, I'll be honest with you. What one of the things that you can do in Excel is you can transform the data. So, uh, or excuse me, transpose the data. So if your data is horizontal, you can transpose it by, um, let's see, I think, imagine that I have this, uh, where is it? Pay, is it under pay special? Yeah, so transposed. So I'm gonna copy this. And then I'm going to paste special transpose. And so what it did was, do you see how it kind of flipped it around the axis? It put name month count on the rows and the data horizontally. So Excel will transpose the data if you don't have it um, in the format that the pivot table likes. So that would be something to experiment with. I, see Lois. Uh, I, I was going to say, Deborah, I think you answered Deborah's question when you just showed like doing, like you said, when you were saying that pivot tables don't want you to do more work, <laughs> they yeah. want you to have those like basic columns. Um, but yeah, I see we have Lois and uh, Alyssa, but I think you can see those now. Yes. Yeah, so Lois says, um, I download student employee evaluation feedback from a Google form into an Excel file, assign each student a color and manually color code each cell that has to do with that student. Wow, I bet that's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> Lois, I, I mean, depending upon how it's formatted, um, I imagine that pivot tables would work very well for you there. Um, and so maybe we could, you know, if you wanted to, I'd be happy to help you look at that and see if it'd be something that would be um, a good you know, practice session. And, and I'm, I'm going to extend this to people as well. If you have data sets and you're interested in help or you'd like uh, uh, someone to look over your shoulder, uh, I'd be happy to work with anybody. We can set up a Zoom meeting and Zoom has a nice um, remote sharing situation where I can, uh, someone can ask permission to interact with your computer screen. So if people are interested, I'd be happy to set up some meetings and we can look at ways to make this work for you. And Alyssa says, use a Google form or other to collect data as you generate it and then use Pivot. Yes, and so Alyssa makes an excellent point. If you've ever made a Google form with data in it, it automatically puts data in a row by row by row format. If you, if you look at the back end Google sheet, for example, it puts a date, usually the first column, I believe, Jenny, please correct me if I'm wrong here, because I know you work a lot with the forms. But like there's usually a date stamp and it puts the data in the first field, all is the same. Does that sound about right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. The only thing that changes is if you were to add a question to the form later, um, but then it usually actually inputs that at the end. But it always has a timestamp and then sort of column by column. I didn't even think about that, but yeah, it would be perfect for stuff like this. Yeah, and um, so you can do things like, again, if you have short answer segment, segments or paragraph segments, those wouldn't work very well to be pivoted on because the data might vary widely. But if you have, say, multiple choice sections or radio buttons or something like that, you can be able to do analyses by, hey, so many people, you know, this, this is the line graph that shows, hey, this is people filling it out and then it dropped down and then all of a sudden it spiked really high. It's because I sent this email out and the numbers went back up. So yeah, that would be another way we could use pivot tables. And as uh, Rachel pointed out, it seems to work very well directly in Google Sheets. Oh, I'm seeing a couple other chats way above here. I did see that uh, 
Deborah's saying something about collecting data on diversity residencies and make analysis easier. And Sharice would says it would um, help with vendor spending statistics. So yeah, I all of these things. I would I think that this would be a great tool. And you know, please, 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 please. We're already <laughs> in a state of uh, heightened uh, anxiety and things like that. When you start to get frustrated about things, um, if you're playing with this, please shoot me an email uh, or chat in Discord or whatever works best for you. I'll see if I can help. And I will go ahead and put the link again to that Google Drive folder. Um, and I'll also make sure that this is included when I put the uh, recorded session up on the uh, LibGuide. But let me put that link in here again. And you know, you have this data and you've seen Brown work with it. So if you want to go and use these to play around, or um, I think that Makaru thing is pretty cool. So put that back in there. If you want to just make up your own fake data set, why not? Um, so I've got that link in the chat too. Um, and then I'm also going to go ahead because I know people might have to start heading out soon. Let me also go ahead and put the um, link to our assessment form. So we would love to get your feedback on this session and all sessions um, that are part of the ULVLC. So I'm going to put that in the chat too. Um, people have been uh, really great about filling that out and it's something that's really helping as we're continuing to plan. Um, this is the first time we've tried kind of a tech training style session. So we would definitely love to get your feedback on that. Um, and I will just go ahead and do one more sort of call for questions if anyone has them. Um, and if not, I want to just say thanks so much to Brown for putting something together like this and go into all the trouble. Um, will I use pivot tables, analyze the feedback? You know what, Carolyn? I think I might. I think that's a great idea. Um, okay, I can send links through email as well. Thanks, Sharice. Do we want to do a little uh, camera moment here for the? Yeah, sure. That sounds great. So if you, yep, you are no longer sharing. So uh, if you want to stop the recording. I will stop the recording. Stop.